Hey everyone, Russ Barkley back again with another commentary on ADHD. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about the decisions or factors that come into choosing the first medication to use for managing ADHD. So this is going to be part one. There's going to be three parts to this so I can keep the video relatively short. And this is a bit redundant with my much longer video on the various medications for ADHD. But I thought I would pull these out and just highlight these issues for you as to the kinds of things clinicians and patients should be thinking about when deciding on the first medication for ADHD. Now, in this part, we're gonna talk about issues that are related to the surrounding context at the time that the patient is seeking evaluation and management. And of course, one of the initial issues we need to think about is how urgent is it that we get control over these ADHD and maybe other symptoms too? If it's really urgent, like immediate, like we needed to do this yesterday, like this child's about to get suspended or expelled from school, or this patient's about to uh, undergo a uh, separation or divorce in their marriage, or maybe they're about to be fired or likely be fired from employment. In other words, there's a crisis at hand and it needs management. So how urgent is control? If it's very urgent, you have to choose a stimulant medication because they work more quickly than any of the other medications, not only in terms of the speed of onset of the medication effects, but also in terms of how quickly we can titrate the medication to get the right dose. You literally could change doses every day and ramp up and find the correct dose within a few days if that were necessary for ADHD management. Normally, we like to take up to a week to judge a dose of medication so that we can see its effects on a variety of contexts and a variety of demands placed on the person. But sometimes we don't have that luxury and we need to get control right away. So that's gonna be the stimulants because they can work within 30 to 45 minutes of the first oral ingestion of the medication, we can start to see changes in behavior. And while the peak effect may not be for 60 minutes to 90 minutes to up to two hours, depending on which medication and which delivery system we're talking about, the fact is we can get effects pretty quickly. So that's one issue we think about. Another is the duration of action. How long do we need this baby to last? So for instance, if you're an adult and you need long-term control that is across the entire day, then you're gonna go with not only one of the extended release medications, you might well choose something like Vyvanse or Lizdex amphetamine because it seems to last about 10 to 14 hours. Now, it still may need to be supplemented with an immediate release form of the same medication, the sort of original pills for amphetamine or methylphenidate or what have you that's being used, but duration of action matters. So within the stimulants, we might choose the extended release forms. But of course, there are the norepinephrine drugs like atomoxetine, uh, or which of course is Stratera or Kelbri or one of those. And then there are the antihypertensive drugs. These drugs take much longer to titrate, to determine the effective dose that's needed for the patient. They can take up to weeks of time, two to three weeks for atomoxetine, maybe even longer for the antihypertensive drugs. So it can take a while, but once we find the right dose, these medications last longer than the stimulants as far as research is able to determine. So um, how long do you need the medication to last? Now, next up, how acceptable is the medication to the patient. There's been a lot of bad press about the stimulant medications in general, and specifically the amphetamines and their risk of addiction. Not, there is little risk of addiction unless you take these intravenously or intranasally, as I've said before. Uh, but how acceptable is it if the patient has been subjected to a lot of bad publicity, wrong as it may be, they may be reluctant to accept a prescription for a stimulant, in which case a non-stimulant might be more acceptable to start with with them. So believe it or not, that's an issue, particularly for parents 
when they're contemplating first medications for their child with ADHD. So in the case of parents, by the way, what's their capacity to supervise the medication? I mean, when it comes to sending a stimulant prescription home, remember, stimulants are Schedule II drugs. They have the potential for diversion and addiction. Uh, and even though that risk is very low for addiction, there is still the possibility of abuse potential for these medications. So they need to be supervised a little bit more co closely. You just can't leave them hanging around on the counter the way you could a non-stimulant medication. Uh, and you might say the same applies to the adult with ADHD. So how likely are they to use this medication responsibly? And that's going to be something we have to think about in prescribing medication. Now, is there a personal or family history of adverse reactions? There are genetic predispositions to drug responding. And if we know that immediate family or extended family, somebody had an adverse reaction to this drug, particularly if it's within the immediate family because of their close genetic relationship to the patient, then we might be a little more reluctant to prescribe that same drug, or we might want to monitor that patient more closely if they're going to try the same medication that didn't work for that relative. So that needs to be thought about by clinicians as well. Uh, also for the stimulants, is there a drug abuser living in that family context, either with the adult with ADHD or with the child with ADHD? Because if there is, there's a likelihood that medication is going to be stolen, sold, diverted, what have you, or even used for the sake of abuse by that particular drug abuser. So we got to think about that sometimes. Context matters. The family ecology is important here. Now, in the case of teens and young adults, are they living away from home? Are they at a private boarding school? Are they at college? If so, we have found that up to 25% of students with ADHD living in dormitories divert their medication to friends and others who want to try it to see if it helps them study or improve their academic performance or just lose weight. So diversion in these environments, particularly college campuses, is an issue the clinician needs to think about. Now, outside of that, we don't have to worry about it with kids who are being supervised every day or with the adult with ADHD, um, although sometimes even they might divert their medication, but it's most commonly seen in the college student population. Finally, we need to think about how available, how affordable is this medication. If we're giving a medication that's still under patent, it's going to be more expensive to use than medications that are generic. Can the family afford the copay? Is it even available within their community? I mean, for instance, we know that methamphetamine, which goes under the brand name of Dizoxin, is one of the most effective medications for adults with ADHD because it's a more potent amphetamine than even the standard amphetamines are. But you're going to have a tough time finding that anywhere in the U.S. because it's highly abusable. It can be stolen very easily. So pharmacies are reluctant to stock it. Physicians are reluctant to prescribe it. So while it may be out there in some places, it's not very likely to be available or prescribed. So that's just another example of things we need to think about in choosing a medication. So there you have it. Is context important for ADHD medication choice? You bet it is. All right, next up is going to be part two, where I talk about patient factors. So thanks for joining me for this short video. I'll see you back for part two of this discussion on how to choose the right starting medication for ADHD. Thanks for watching. Live well, be well.